Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. By the way, uh, it would be great. Um, and I think this tutorial here is particularly exciting and um, uh, gives kind of the, the flavor of these things because it's, it's topical and it's, uh, it's a fascinating new area, um, digital currencies. And we also have a very competent speaker, Aviv Soha from the Hebrew University. Um, Aviv obtained his PhD from the Hebrew University, then came to Microsoft Research in Silicon Valley and did a postdoc there, and has now for two years uh, been a faculty member back at his home university, Hebrew University. He's going to talk about uh, Bitcoin, the digital currency, which probably most of you have heard about, and um, he will also give a more in-depth talk, uh, mentioning some of his own results, on incentive structures and scalability for the Bitcoin system tomorrow at 11 o'clock in, in case you are so fascinated by the introduction today that you would like to f have that uh, deeper follow on. All right, uh, so with, without much ado, um, uh, please go ahead, Avid. Thank you. Um, it's good to be here. Um, so I'm going to give you kind of a broad overview of the Bitcoin system. Uh, this is going to be a very basic uh, look. Uh, so in this talk, I'll just cover what is Bitcoin and how it basically works. Uh, in the second talk tomorrow, I'll try to go deeper into the Bitcoin ecosystem. As Torres said, there is a lot of uh, very interesting stuff there. So if you're interested by what I say today, uh, be sure to be there tomorrow as well. Uh, let me start by talking about regular money and why we need something uh, to, re to, to kind of replace it or to improve it. So I'm going to start with what Dan Kaminsky recently wrote about money. And if you think about money a little bit, you, you might notice that it's gotten a little buggy, right? It's not doing everything that we'd expect it to do anymore. Uh, if you think of cash, for example, then cash, obtaining cash, you have to go to the ATM which is a bother. You have to go and get it. This is what economists call shoe leather costs. You wear, you wear out the leather on your shoes as you do this. Um, cash itself is not infinitely divisible, right? Or it's not easily divisible. You, you're always out of exact change when, when you need it. And you cannot easily send it, right? If you want to send it to somebody in China, you'd have a hard time stuffing it into an envelope and waiting for the letter to arrive. Uh, so we have these modern things that are not so new anymore. Uh, wire transfers, for example, are, uh, um, are only, are, are, I'm sorry, this, uh, this has gotten mixed, the wire transfers and the credit cards. This should be the credit cards are only for customer to merchant transactions. They have relatively high fees, right? You pay 2 3% when you do credit card transactions. Uh, and credit card numbers are easily stolen. So the, the way you use credit cards in regular life is you give your, the credit card number to someone. And this is exactly the information that he needs to then turn around and use the credit card somewhere else and steal your money. Okay, so, so, so this has made credit cards not so reliable for the internet. And if you think about it, credit cards are really a technology from, from the 50s. Uh, wire transfers, on the other hand, are very slow. They take several days. If you ever tried to send money to China, and I've tried, it takes uh, three, four business days, maybe a week, and there are extremely high fees. If you send $100 to China, you might end up paying $40 in fees, for example. Uh, and when we think about money, money is basically just information, right? Money just, is just a way of remembering who owes what and who has done something for us, who's given a service or provided us with, with a certain good and should get something in, in exchange for that later. So in sending information across the world is something that we're used to doing very fast. So why can't we send money as easily as we send an email or a text message to somebody far away? So the point of all of this is to basically say, you know, we are overdue for a revolution in money transfer, right? It's, 
It's very easy to, to send information. The infrastructure is there. The internet is there. Why can't we send money very quickly? Um, so before we go into Bitcoin, let me just start with this point. What is, what is actually money? What gives money value? Does anybody know? What is the thing that makes this worth something? I'm willing to do work for this, but not for this. Trust. So, so it's, right, it's a delusion. It's basically what makes this worthwhile, you know, worth, worth, worth anything is, is belief. The belief that when I accept it now, I will go to somebody else and he will give me goods for, for this piece of paper. Okay, now why would he do it? Because he believes, you know, somebody at the grocery store will accept it because he can later go to, the, to, 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 uh, to buy gas with it and somebody there will accept the same piece of paper from him. Okay, so, so there's nothing backing money. There's no gold in the vault. Yeah? Well, I differ. I beg to differ slightly. Okay. Because the government will accept my taxes in the one on the left. Yeah, so, so the government is not the only uh, economic entity out there. And there are currencies there that the government won't accept your taxes in, but, but are still worthwhile. So you can think of Ithaca hours as a currency that's used in Ithaca, and it's, you know, it's traded. People, people find it useful. You have, uh, I don't know, mile, miles that you might be able to trade, you know, uh, frequent, frequent flyer miles that are worth something. So the government is just one more economic entity. It's, it's a very large one, and it has a lot of guns and police. So it's, it's very persuasive, but, but, uh, but it's still just belief. If, if you stop believing that the, that the government is, is any good, the value of the currency also drops. So it's all about belief in the fact that the government is worthwhile. Um, so, so this is just to clarify the point, because a lot of the time I, I give these talks and people say, well, there's gold behind money. And there hasn't been gold backing our money since, I think, the 70s. Okay. So Bitcoin is also a new form of, of money, uh, and it's a decentralized digital currency. And I underline decentralized because most of our money is already digital, right? We do a lot of transactions digitally, um, and this is really the innovation. Uh, Bitcoin was invented by somebody called Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008, and it's been running since 2009. And we actually don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto is. He invented the currency and uh, worked on development for a couple of years and then wrote to say he's moving on to other things and nobody knows who he is. So there are a few people in Japan that are actually named Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> None of them appears to have made the currency. Some, I think they don't even speak English that well. But Satoshi Nakamoto is obviously well versed in English. And he's probably had some academic training because you see him write this paper about Bitcoin and it's in, you know, it's, it's got citations. When, when you write papers, you know, it's, you know, it's, he's, he's probably done it before. Yeah, so if, probably the NSA knows who he is, but nobody else. He's corresponded with people under this alias. And when he put up a website for Bitcoin, he's, he did it through an anonymous, uh, a service and we, we just have no idea. So that's one of the mysteries of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, of course, has all the advantages of digital money. Um, it's very easy to divide. You can just add uh, and subtract fractions of it. Um, it's very easy to store because it's just bit, bits on computers. So you don't have to have these large vaults built. Um, it should have very low fees because uh, it's very easy to transfer. You just do computational uh, actions instead of having to drive it around in a, I don't know, a Brinks uh, armored car. Um, yeah, and, it's, and you can send it anywhere in the world, wherever, whenever you have an internet connection. So, uh, kind of paraphrasing on the motto of, I guess, the American currency, in God we trust, of the US dollar, Bitcoin's motto uh, has, or, well, some people have adopted this as the motto, is vir virus in numeris, which basically means in Latin, strength in numbers. So strength in numbers in the sense that we trust the math, we trust the computer science, but also we trust the numbers. This is going to be a decentralized system, and the more people that join it, the stronger it will be. 
Okay, so strength in numbers. And this, the centralized nature of Bitcoin gives it a lot of <laughs> other properties that are very controversial. Uh, so I, I would call these features, some people think of them as terrible, terrible things. Uh, for example, Bitcoin transactions are going to be pseudon pseudonymous, uh, that not exactly anonymous, you don't do them an anonymously, but you, you can use a pseudonym for, for each new transaction, you can do it under a new identity. Uh, there's going to be a fixed amount of coins at some point. There's not going to be any more uh, uh, beyond 21 million bitcoins. Uh, and that also implies that there's not going to be inflation that's triggered by somebody printing money. So you might like that aspect of this. Or you might say no, no government is going to be able to, to rescue us if we're in an economic depression and we need to print money. Right? So this is a controversial feature. Uh, trans transfers are going to be irreversible because unlike credit cards, you don't have anybody to call and say, you know, my credit card's been stolen and I need to get the money back. There is a system that's distributed. It's not going to have anybody that you could call. So every transfer is, is as if you, you, you gave somebody cash. If you, want, if you want the money back, he has to give it back to you. Um, money cannot be seized in Bitcoin. If you have a court order and you come to somebody in the system and you say, okay, I want you to give me this guy's money or you need to freeze that account for me because this is a drug dealer, uh, then you cannot do it because there is no centralized point where you can go and serve that warrant. It's actually a distributed system. You would have to get a majority of, of, of the nodes. Uh, so these are also very controversial if you're, if you're uh, interested in, in, I don't know, grabbing money from drug dealers, that's very bad. But also, if you're, a, if you're a, just a person worried about his money, then, then maybe you, you, you don't want the government to be able to seize your funds or freeze them. Um, two other aspects here that I've mentioned, escrow accounts and joint accounts, are, are just basically features that can be built in, are, that are built into Bitcoin that allow for more advanced transactions. You can have escrow ca accounts without any third party acting as the escrow, and you can have joint accounts where you, can, where you need several si signatures to move money. You have a lot of features that are built into money, uh, built into the protocol itself without needing anybody else to provide them. Uh, yeah, questions? Fascinating slide. Um, it's controversial, and do you, I mean, we can post delay till the end. But uh, some of these properties, one could challenge that whether these properties really hold. I mean, in some sense, it, it also depends on the belief of the people in the Bitcoin community whether these properties hold or not. Because if everyone w wants to change the rules, potentially they could change the rules. Right. 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 So, so the rules, of course, can be changed. I'm talking about Bitcoin as it is, um, but. Uh, in some sense, many of them are due to the decentralized nature. It's going to be very hard to reverse them without the majority's decision, right? In that sense, they are, they are stable. So in general, I'm, I'm very happy to take questions as, as, as you have them. I'm, I'm, I don't want to, uh, to wait until the end. Yeah. Um, you said that they can't be seized, but um, uh, what's his name? the Dread Pirate Roberts, I think he called himself from Silk Road. Yes. Um, all of his bitcoins were seized um, yes. by, I think it was ICE agents. So, so, I mean, so how did they do it? They took all of his computers. So basically, you do have you do have some way to move your money, right? You should you should have some. In in Bitcoin's case, it's a private key, and if you have your private key on your computer, then and somebody gains access to that, they can take your money. But if you encrypt your private key, and you could do that very easily, then nobody can you know without cracking your password, nobody can move your money. Uh, necessarily decrypt your private key. They don't need to actually get your private key. They only need to take it away from you for you to lose access to all of those funds. Right, you lose access to it, but, but if you keep copies, if you, you know, if, you, if you just remember a passphrase that is used to generate that key, it's very hard to take from you. So it's very easy to keep your money secure uh, in that sense. Frozen. So if, if the US government says that <laughs> these bitcoins can no longer be spent in the US, um, like these particular bitcoins, then of course you can go and spend them somewhere else. Yeah. But um, it, they may be less valuable because... Um, but it's also impossible to know what's, what's spent in the US. 
So when I send it to someone, he's using an identity that might not be known to the US government. And if he's not registered on any database, how do they know it's him? Right? That's a question. They don't need to know, because they can track the coins on every account they move into their tainted. And the government says, well, if anybody on our soil um, <coughs> uses you this Bitcoin yeah. or any other part, fraction of this Bitcoin, you're going to make them pay in dollars. And suddenly, this particular Bitcoin will be much less valuable to anybody who knows this. So assuming Bitcoin is a bit more popular, people know about That's this. That's right. So there could be a blacklist, and that would very easily give the, any government, or at least some governments, the ability to, to devalue individual Bitcoins. That's right. So if you try and track money and maybe taint it in some, in some sense, and you say, this is dirty money that no, no matter where it goes, I will not allow it to be cashed into dollars on our soil, that could be done. And so people are working on, on improvements to the protocol that make it completely anonymous. That basically say, you can see money that has moved from somebody to somebody. Uh, you don't know how much. You don't know who. Uh, you just know that the transfer was uh, le legitimate. And this is a, a paper called uh, Zero Coin. And now a, a new system and an improvement of it is going to come out called Zero Cash. Uh, so basically, these things are also possible. Yeah. Called Satoshi Dice, which is like a gambling website, but you can use it to wash your money. So <laughs> you you gamble, but you have a, a, a guarantee that you get a part back, and then basically everybody gambles at the same time, and you get sort of a mixing of the money. So yes. So there are other mixers, by the way. If you go to the some of the online wallets, they will and and you say I want to pay somebody. There is a protocol called CoinJoin that will mix your money with other payments. Uh, a lot of inputs come in, a lot of outputs go out. Nobody can say which money went where. Uh, and there is, a, in general, a, a very large, a very, a very intense battle about, uh, about money tainting and about how to avoid it, and a lot of discussions of this in the Bitcoin community. All right, so let's, let's go on. So if you want to buy Bitcoins, you, you just do it like any other foreign currency. You go to an exchange, and you can just trade Bitcoins for, for US dollars or pounds or whatever you want. And these are, this is a, an exchange in Japan, and these two are in Europe, and this is one in Israel. Okay, so you have lots of these all over the world now. Um, the price of Bitcoin, of course, has changed a lot. It's been on the news quite a lot. Uh, a year ago, it was around $20 per Bitcoin. Today, it's around $820 per Bitcoin, at least on, on one of the Euro European exchanges. Um, and you know these fluctuations are very bad for currencies. That's, that's not a very good thing when your currency changes its value so much. Uh, but this is part of the growing pains of Bitcoin. So th this was a bubble in April. Uh, and this is the recent bubble, I think, due to the Chinese interest in, in Bitcoin, which ended pretty much when, when the Chinese government issued some announcement saying that Bitcoin is a little too dangerous. Um, so this volatility, of course, uh, brings us a lot of tales of you know, people getting rich really fast. Uh, the first Bitcoin transaction ever was actually somebody who bought two pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoins. This is now, you know, at, at the peak of the bubble at least, this was over $10 million. Um, that, th those are kind of expensive pizzas. And also about this uh, guy who threw away his computer with his private keys on it. Uh, and he <coughs> remembered after doing that that he had, uh, had all these Bitcoins there that are now worth, or at least during the bubble, I think were worth $7.5 million. So I think people are now moving through the dump area where, where the computer was thrown away and with metal detectors looking for that computer and whoever finds it. So th there's a buried treasure of seven and a half million dollars, uh, depending on, on the value of Bitcoins that day. So if you wanted to spend your Bitcoins, you could do it in, at, at various uh, places. Uh, you could buy electronics online. There are some merchants who are uh, accepting it. You could go gamble on that website called Satoshi Dice. Uh, I guess you could buy a beer in Cambridge. There's a pub here that's supposed to accept Bitcoin. Uh, but you could also do things like donate money to WikiLeaks, which is something that uh, uh, the U.S. government and other governments in Europe are not very happy that you do. Or you could give money to charity. This is a charity that helps the homeless in Florida that's uh, been very no well known for accepting Bitcoins. 
So there, are, there is merchant adoption. There's not a lot of it. So Bitcoin is not uh, very common. You still cannot go to your local grocery store. But you could expect some global businesses that you know, mail you their, uh, their merchandise to accept Bitcoins. They immediately have a, uh, a, a lot of customers who, who will be very happy to give them Bitcoins. Okay, so, so there are a few businesses. And of course, uh, somebody mentioned before the, one of the more well-known businesses that used to accept Bitcoins, that's the Silk Road. This is a website that is pretty much like eBay, except that the things that you buy and sell on, on, on the Silk Road is, was usually drugs. So this was operating, I think, usually in the US. You would pay in Bitcoins anon anonymously or almost anonymously. Um, and the merchant would send you the, the drugs by mail. Um, and the operator of the Silk Road would just act as an escrow service. He would take the money from, from the drug buyer, hold it until the drug dealer pro provides the merchandise, and then, send, and then release the funds. And he would take his commission along the way. So this guy uh, ended up being busted by the FBI. It turns out he's probably this young man called Ross... Uh, uh, Russ Ulbricht. Uh, he was known on the website as the Dread Pirate Roberts from The Princess Bride, if you know the movie. Um, and this guy turns out to be, you know, the, just a 29-year-old guy living with roommates, uh, running his drug empire from, from his laptop without his roommates knowing about it. Um, and it, I, th I think more than anything, it just shows you the, the strength of Bitcoin, right? You have somebody doing this, running this business, which is very high risk if you would try to do it without Bitcoin, right? If you try to be, uh, right, moving th these huge amounts of money uh, and doing it well and getting the trust of drug dealers and drug buyers, right? Um, it would be very hard, but this guy just did it alone on his laptop. So, so it, it, it's, it's a very bad example of something maybe that we want, want to see uh, bought and sold. But it's also another example of a business that handles large amounts of money, which is only possible because money is now in digital form. It has an API. You can design a program that does whatever you want. You don't need a very large staff. Uh, so now this, the feds have gotten his computer and the servers that he was running uh, everything from, and they are trying to now liquidate. They're thinking of liquidating the Bitcoins that they seized uh, off, of, off of the website. This is the 25 million that they talk about here is not his own, f the, this isn't his own money, but rather the money that was held in escrow in the meantime. So he wasn't using the, the sophisticated escrow techniques that are built into Bitcoin, but his competitors and successors are now improving things. So this website is not, by f not the last w uh, one that we'll see, and not, definitely not the only one. All right. So let's talk about what Bitcoin does more, uh, more specifically. So if you usually go to a bank and you, and you want to move money around, the bank remembers where your money is, you know, how much money everybody has. So the blue agent might have $2 in his account. The red agent might have a dollar. And um, when, you, when you want to move money, you just tell the bank, you know, change my balance here, shift, it, shift this $1 from here to here. Okay, so, so this requires trust in the bank. When you tell the bank, uh, move money, you, you, want him, you want the server to comply, uh, you also need to trust the bank not to erase your money and so on. All these things are, are possible. Um, so all of this invites very costly regulation, right? Making sure that you're not laundering money, making sure that you're not cheating customers and so on. Uh, and, and it has very high entry uh, barriers. If you want to become a bank, you have to have, um, uh, you have to be very big in, in, uh, generally. Um, so that means there's relatively little competition between banks, which basically means there are, there are very high fees for, trans, for transmitting money. And I'm not just talking about banks. You could also think of Visa and MasterCard and PayPal as, as players in this game. So what Bitcoin aims to do is to replace this centralized system with a peer-to-peer -peer network. And the goal is to increase competition and to create this open system where everybody can join and be part of the banking system. 
and that will drive down fees. Okay, and that also means that uh, Bitcoin nodes uh, remember all of the account balances, and Bitcoin does this very primitively in, in some sense. Everything is replicated. All the data is replicated everywhere. And now we have a decentralized system. And you need to understand how, how revolutionary this thing is. Basically, um, there is no server that you can now go to and say, okay, I want you to take away the money from the blue guy because everybody else still has copies of the data. They won't let you uh, do this change or at least they will start ignoring your messages once you do this. Okay, so everybody's going to check up on everybody. Uh, there's, no more, there's no centralized point anymore. There's nowhere to apply regulation. And so this is a very subversive protocol by nature. It tries to to do what BitTorrent has done for file distribution, that you can very, it, you find it very hard to stop BitTorrent users. You cannot sue two million people if they're sharing files. It's very hard to stop many, many nodes if, they're, if they decide uh, not to comply with, with regulation, for example. Okay, so this is what Bitcoin aims to do. So one of the implications of having the data structure replicated, all the data replicated everywhere, is that whenever somebody moves money, you have to send a message everywhere, right? So if the blue guy is sending money to the red guy, you have to spread the message. And so every transaction is seen by everyone on the network. And the network is open. So you can go to a website, for example, this is blockchain.info, and you can see a stream of the transactions that are now occurring. And in particular, you can go and see the, the address that got uh, Dread Pirate Roberts seized coins. And you can see uh, this is the private, uh, his private money. He has 144,000 bitcoins on there, which are, I, I guess, over $100 million at today's exchange rates. Um, and these are his personal funds. And I, I, I think they say that there are more that the FBI didn't manage to, to grab. Um, so, so you can follow everything. You, this is now money belonging to the FBI. This is an address held by the FBI. Okay, but we only know that because somebody tagged the, the address. We, we wouldn't otherwise know. We, there was an article in the newspaper that, that, saying that they seized a lot of money. So somebody goes to the blockchain, blockchain.info, and looks for, uh, for a large transaction, and there, there it is. Sorry? So this isn't really taint analysis so much as, yeah, so, so, so much as you know, somebody just tagged this transaction, uh, th this address as belonging to the FBI. It might not be the right thing. All right, so is, it is a form of, oh, right here in twos, yes. So you can try and see where the money has been. There are, there are various attempts at doing this. There are also academic papers doing this. Um, and I'll, I'll mention them a little later. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Road. Can somebody tag Silk Road's address, and by that, will people know that I'm not that I'm planning to buy Silk Road? <laughs> oh no, case. just I theoretically, think. sure. Um, uh, so, so can you can you uh, can somebody know that you've bought off Silk Road? So, what Silk Road can do is they can generate a new address every time they accept money, and the question is, how do you uh, later? Uh, when they, eventually they want to aggregate money from these addresses. So you might be able to tell that it's the Silk Road. Uh, definitely you can go through mixers and you can buy through the Silk Road, but you, nobody knows that you've actually sent them money. Or if you're using one of the newer protocols that are fully anonymized, then nobody will know anything. Um, so this is the current state of Bitcoin where you can still see the addresses and you can track money. If you click on one of these links, you actually have all the... Uh, all the information of where it came, where the money came from, which addresses, and where it's going. Okay, so you can follow money yourself. Okay, so now the the main problem that Bitcoin has to solve in order to keep its decentralized data data structure uh, in, uh, intact is basically a system, a problem that's that's common to systems uh, that are distributed, and that's the consistency problem. Right, somebody can very easily create two messages that look perfectly fine when you just look at one of them. Uh, for example, uh, I could be the red agent and I could say, let's move all my money to the blue guy or send all my money to the green guy. I create both of these transactions. 
I sign them cryptographically. Each one of them is consistent with the data in every node, but I send the messages to different nodes in the network. And now they have to kind of talk to, to each other because we're not, uh, we, we don't want to allow both of these transactions to occur at the same time. I cannot give all of my money to one guy and all of my money to, to somebody else, right? This, this would be uh, a problem. And this is called a double spending attack, okay? If, if I try to do something like that, uh, I might get away with it and, and be able to spend um, the same coin twice. So Bitcoin solves this double spend problem uh, using its data structure. And the data structure is known as the blockchain. Okay, so this is how uh, the solution is basically built. Uh, the blockchain is, in essence, just a, a, a record of all the transactions that ever occurred. Everything from the, from, from the beginning of time until now. So every uh, block in the blockchain just contains transactions and a few other fields. So the first field that I wrote here is just the hash of the previous block in the chain. This is basically an identifier. It's a cryptographic hash function. It just identifies what the previous block was in a way that could not be uh, uh, fudged or, or forged. Um, and we'll talk about the second uh, field right here in a second. So as transactions are occurring on the network, we want the blockchain to grow. So we're basically adding new blocks, okay? This, is, this proceeds as, as time goes, okay? So uh, we're hearing about transactions. We're putting them into this new block. And if we get, ever get this tr conflicting transaction where red maybe paid all his money to blue, and now he wants to give the same money to green, then we're throwing it away. We're not putting it into the block, okay? Now we're supposed to send this block to our neighbors, tell them that uh, we have this new uh, set of transactions that we'd like to accept. And of course, I didn't solve the problem here because my neighbor might do the same thing. He might send us a block that has co conflicting transactions, specifically the ones we threw out. Okay, so we still might have a conflict in terms of, of, of the blocks, right? We have the same block pointing maybe to the same history of transactions, but it contains different transactions. So Bitcoin uh, has to uh, kind of get over this somehow. And there are basically two rules in the solution. The first rule says that we should make block creation a something that's very hard. Okay, why, why does that help? Uh, if block creation is hard, we don't have many blocks that are created at the same time, right? So we don't have as many conflicts as before. Uh, so my neighbor might not create a block and I, w when I send him my block, everything will be just fine. Uh, so in order to make block creation hard, uh, we just make, uh, we, we use a computational problem that's hard that you have to solve in order to create a block that's legitimate. So this is where this field called the nonce comes in. Uh, basically what you do is you take a hash, you hash the, the information in the block. This gives you a series of bits that looks, to, looks random. If it's, it's a cryptographic hash, so you don't know what the bits were will be before you actually compute it. Um, and if this number is really, really small, then the block is considered to be valid. If you didn't manage to find a small number, what you can do is you can change the nonce field. You can just put a different string of bits inside it and you recompute the hash. And because it's a cryptographic hash, even, a, even changing one bit makes everything randomly uh, changed again. And you might hit the target and find a small number. So when I say a small number, I basically mean uh, at, at today's difficulty, maybe around 60 of the most significant bits have to be zero. So you have to try two to the 60 attempts to actually manage to find one in expectation or something like that. So this is very hard. And this small number that you have to, to be under adjusts automatically so that one block is created in the entire Bitcoin network only once every 10 minutes. Okay, any questions about this? Yeah. How is it automatically changing so to maintain that? Uh, so basically, they, they, when you have the blockchain, you look at the, at the number of blocks that were created in the past two weeks. And if it's more than once every 10 minutes, you, you, you lower the number and make it harder to, to create blocks. 
So you do this automatically, and you can, you can try and hit that target. So it's, it's not exactly once every 10 minutes, but it's around that. Yeah? So doesn't that mean if, suppose I'm the NSA, right, and I have a lot of computing power at my disposal, I can essentially cause a denial of service attack by, for two weeks, applying all my compute power into creating ha uh, blocks of bogus internal transactions that I have. Sure. Right. And then after that, ordinary people can't do transactions anymore. Um, no. Uh, so there is a limit on, on how, how fast this can grow or go down. Uh, I think the difficulty only changes uh, by a factor of four at most. So you could make it harder after two weeks, but you couldn't make it infinitely harder, if, even if you had a lot of computing power. Okay, it's, it's still, as I'm, I'm going to show you why it's still very costly even to do that. What you, what you said, create a lot of blocks in, in the period of two weeks is going to be very, very hard, even for the NSA, I think. Yes? Could you do something like randomly pick when you have complex? Sorry? Like random, could you randomly pick which one wins and then have that somehow propagate? So I'll, sh I'll show you in a second what's, what the second rule is and how you pick when, when there are conflicts. I'll show that in a second. All right, any more questions? Okay. So the second rule, of course, is, is, is that there still, may be, there's, there still may be conflicts, of course, uh, because uh, even though block creation is very hard, it might still occur twice at the same time throughout the network somewhere. And the way we're going to handle it is by adopting conflicting blocks only if they make a longer chain than we have currently. Okay? So let me give you a little bit of intuition as to why this actually helps us do anything. So here is the network, and here are the two rules that we have. Make block creation hard, and adopt conflicting blocks only if they make a longer chain. Um, so let's suppose somebody creates a block right here, this node, and sends it to the neighbors, to its neighbors. And they're very happy to accept this block. It makes their chain a little longer, uh, so everything is fine. But at the same time, somewhere in the network, another block is created, and it's also propagated to some nodes. Okay, so these guys, A, those who have A1 and B1, when they exchange blocks, nobody accepts the other guy's block because it's conflicting and, and it makes up a chain of the same length. And the world co continues working. We, we still have transactions running through the network. Uh, we still try to create blocks on top of our current chain. And so at some point, somebody succeeds. Okay, so let's say this node built another block, A2. Now it can send it to its neighbors. Everybody who has A1 is happy, it extends their current chain, but even uh, the neighbors that have B1 will accept this new block because it makes a, a longer chain. And now they replace what their history was with this longer version. Okay, so now you might notice that we have more, more uh, nodes working on this chain, on this longer chain, and the chance that this longer chain will build uh, the next block is even greater. So once we have a winner in terms of the race, it is very easy for, 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 the, for the winning version of history to recruit more nodes to work on, on the same problem. And there is a winner-take-all effect here. So we might have a tie. Uh, this uh, node that built B1 might also build another block on top of it. But now there's more computational power working on this version. Yeah? You said one of the advantages was the quick transfer of funds. Yes. But, uh, we also said block creation takes 10 minutes, it's hard, yes. and there may be some conflict resolution as well, which may be multiple rounds. Yes. So how long since I get some Bitcoin from someone, or it looks like I do, before I can go, okay, I believe this to be valid now? Okay, so I'll show the exact numbers really soon, but you are right. You basically have to wait 10 minutes to get into the first block, more time to get into further blocks, and uh, in fact, you're only going to be guaranteed that the money has been moved and, and will not uh, be taken away after several blocks have been built. Okay, and I'll show exactly why soon. But uh, think of the time scales as being maybe one hour, two hours to, to be fully accepted within uh, a reasonable margin of error. And, and you could argue that this, this is still fast. Okay, why? Because wire transfer ta takes days. And if you think about Visa moving money through credit card, it's, it looks like it's instantaneous. But really, if you're a merchant, the transaction can be reversed 
maybe a month or two after you, you've received the money. Okay, so some people, for example, have, have tried withdrawing money from ATMs at the same time in different countries. And because the ATMs are not well synchronized, they, they were able to withdraw the same, the same money basically twice. So other systems look like they, they give you money instantaneously, but basically they're, they're not doing this very well, right? They're not coordinating uh, between very different locations very well. Um, and having said that, I, th I still think that Bitcoin can be accelerated if you want to, to, to know exactly how. Uh, and I think we can get to maybe one second per block. Uh, you should come tomorrow to the second part. You know, if we're talking about sort of the architecture of systems, one, yes. of, the the, one of the architectural advantages of a centralized system, yes. there are other disadvantages. One of the advantages is you can be quicker, right? You I mean, could this be has quicker if you wanted. Yeah, that's right. Necessary delay. Uh, when I was in Hong Kong growing up, this was, you know, two decades ago, the, in the transfer was instantaneous, right? I mean, right. you know, we have a balance machine here, we have a withdrawal machine here, and I tried it, and, uh, you know, you could not tell. The that's true. And that was decades ago. Yes, that's true. That's also true now, right? If you were, uh, if you go to the U.S. and you you you're in bank of in the Bank of America and you move money between customers of the bank, that's fine. But what happens when you try to do this something globally? So the systems that need to interact with one another are very old and they, they are very slow. If you think about wire transfers, a person has to literally look at your transfer and make sure that it's not money laundering. This is not all done by computer. There is actually a person looking at every transaction. Um, and so this, there hasn't been a push to automate this. So the appearance of Bitcoin, you know, might, what, what it might do to the industry is it might push it to go to where we know centralized systems can be, and that is much faster. Um, it takes a lot of coordination between a lot of different entities. And right now they're in this equilibrium where they have something that works. It's relatively slow. There's no need to change it because there's no competitor. Right? But I think uh, Bitcoin can be faster, but you're right, basically this architecture that replicates information everywhere and needs to keep it consistent is very wasteful and is actually doing, is supposed to do worse than the centralized systems, right? Okay, any more questions? Yeah. So, um, I mean, you mentioned how a longer blockchain is, is generally accepted. Yeah. Um, what would prevent uh, like a mining pool or someone with enough power like the NSA um, saying that you have effectively given me all of your coins? And if they do it enough and quick enough and hide the blocks from the rest of um, well, everyone else in the network and allow their chain to get longer than everyone else, as soon as it's longer, their chain will replace everyone else's network and all of your Bitcoins would disappear. That's right. But let me get to that in a, in a slide or two. Okay, I'll, I'll get to that exactly. That's a, that's a good question. All right, so let's, let's try to get to that. So Satoshi Nakamoto's guarantee for us in terms of security, what I've just showed you is, right, is, is a node that had a certain history B1 and was re replacing it with A1 and A2. So the guarantee is that as long as the attacker controls less than 50% of the computing power in the network, less than 50%, then the probability that replacement of blocks will occur goes down exponentially with time. So if we wait a little bit, Maybe it's, it's 50%. We wait a little bit more, it's 20, 25%. Uh, so going down exponentially basically means that after a little while, things are, you know, the, the, the probability of replacement becomes astronomically small. Okay? Yeah. Can you give an intuition for that? Because it doesn't seem that that's the case. It seems like the new blocks get created close to whoever is actually engaging in transactions, as you've described it so far, and that's not... Averaged out over the computer. So transactions are sent out really quickly, but blocks are created once every 10 minutes, which is very, very long, uh, a long waiting period, right? So they can be, you know, as far as you want from the person creating the transaction. Uh, and they aggregate a lot of transactions. You may not have heard about all of them, but that's fine. You put what you've heard of into the block, the rest will go into the next block. That's fine. Okay? Yeah. But in, maybe I'm missing something. In your scenario where you're saying you need effectively 50% or more of the computing power. I don't right. think that's quite true because if, assuming I'm the rogue agent in the network, I can keep accepting your blocks as you create them correctly. It only takes that, that small probability of me creating a block ahead of you to create a freight transaction. 
and I only need to do that once for me to right. But, the but system. Once, a once, a once one of my transactions is, is deep inside the chain, in order to replace that specific trans transaction, you have to replace the whole tail of the chain. So you have to build a longer chain than that one and cause that to be thrown out. So I'm not talking about replacing the latest transaction, but some transaction in the network that is already buried inside the chain. Okay, I'll give you more intuition about that in a second. Let me just say one thing about the incentives here. This is really important. So whenever a block is created, we want to, in, we want to uh, basically incentivize block creation and, and want people to work on, on this thing. So we, uh, what we do is we pay, we pay everybody who closes a block, who creates a block. Uh, and payment comes from two sources. One source is uh, a small fee that comes out of every transaction. Transactions offer a fee to whoever closes them. And the second is money that's created out of thin air. So money has to be created at some point. And the creation event is basically every time a block is created, that guy who created the block gets the money. Uh, what this means is that a lot of people will want to do this work. Okay, so regarding uh, the money creation, I told you that no more money is going to be, no more than 21 million coins are going to be created at some point. Uh, and this is because the rate of money creation goes down and it converges, the, the amount of money converges to this 21 million. Uh, at first we were creating 50 bitcoins per block. Uh, at every four years this rate is halved, so at 2013, Bitcoin switched to creating 25, transactions, uh, 25 Bitcoins per block, and this will uh, get halved again four years later. Um, so, of course, this amount of money, 25, uh, 25 Bitcoins per block, means around $25,000 at the height of the bubble, or uh, a little less now, but that's a lot of money. Uh, and so the hash rate of, of the network has grown uh, quite substantially. Uh, and people have started creating, you know, these racks of computers that are just used to, to mine Bitcoins. And at some point they started creating um, custom chips that do uh, hashes very fast and are able to create blocks very fast. And now these, are, these come pack, uh, packaged in, in, in nice boxes with a lot of cooling. Um, and basically the hash rate has gone up through the roof. So this is, uh, just to give numbers, I think... Maybe last year they surpassed the top 100 supercomputers in the world combined in terms of hashes per second. Uh, this is now 20 petahashes. So you can think of what that means. Uh, I think my computer does a few mega hashes uh, per second, nothing more. Uh, very quickly, I think this new hardware puts us way, way over what you could do with normal computers. Yeah. So is there any Uh, yes, there is a limit on the block size. The block size is currently limited at one megabyte per, uh, to kind of avoid uh, denial of service attacks by somebody creating very large blocks, but the limit has not been reached yet. So there aren't one megabyte of transactions occurring. Uh, every transaction is really usually very small. It's half a kilobyte. And there aren't as many transactions in the network as, as, as it would take to fill out the blocks. Um, okay, let's go on. Uh, so I want to show you what the attack looks like in Bitcoin. Uh, so this is the double spend attack. We kind of talked about this before. So let's say there, somebody has a transaction in, inside the chain and he wants to reverse that transaction. So what he can do is he can create a, uh, an alternative history of blocks. And if he finds something that's longer, right, then he can make the, the, this, maybe this transaction go away. It's not in the alternative one. Right? So this is going to be harder and harder the more uh, blocks are here because um, it's, it's very hard to create every block. We have to work a lot. We need more computational power. And as we work, this blockchain is continuing to grow. Right? The, the network is still adding blocks on top here. And we're ha we have to be faster than that. Um, so if you want to really analyze the attack mathematically, what you basically do is you look at at the difference in the length of chains. So if these states are basically encode the difference in, in length, right, the honest chains length minus the attackers, then whenever the network creates a block, we add one to the difference, and this is bad for the attacker. And whenever the attacker creates a block, we just move back in the other direction. 
And of course, if we ever reach the state where the attacker's chain is longer, uh, the attacker is one. Uh, this event occurs with some probability one minus Q and this with probability Q, given that the attacker has some fraction Q of the computational power. Okay, so this is basically a random walk that is biased. If the Q is smaller than one half, it's biased towards uh, uh, higher numbers. Uh, so there is some probability that we never get here. Okay, and the farther away we start, the less likely it is that we ever end up here. Okay, so of course we don't exactly know what the attacker's uh, chain length is, so we cannot put a state here, but given that we accept the transaction only after n blocks have been built on top of it, we have some probability distribution over where the attacker is, and we can do this, the math and find everything out. And what you get is this very ugly looking formula that's taken from uh, a paper by Manny Ronsenfeld. He's uh, corrected the analysis that Satoshi Nakamoto's done originally, which was a little uh, faulty. Uh, and this, this is not very readable, but what you can do is you can look at this in tabular form. And if somebody, for example, con uh, controls, let's say 10% of the computational power of the network, and you wait for one block, then you have I don't know, is that 20% chance of ever uh, switching uh, the transaction? And it goes down very, very fast. So usually things are thought to be very safe after maybe th six, uh, six blocks have, have been created. There's very small chance that you'll ever manage to replace a transaction. And of course, what you have to remember is that because the Bitcoin network is so large, this is very, very costly, right? If you need 10% of the Bitcoin network, that's going to cost you in the millions. So if all I'm doing is selling a cup of coffee, you know, I might take the risk that somebody has 10% of the computational power and is trying to cheat me out of that payment for the cup of coffee. On the other hand, if I'm selling a car, I might want to wait longer, make sure the money is actually been transferred, and longer would just mean maybe just wait another hour to make sure the funds have cleared. So it's very reasonable if you're moving $100 million to wait an extra hour or two just to make sure, but if you're selling coffee, you might even decide to give coffee without any confirmations in, in the sense of, uh, you just see the transaction in the network, you don't even wait to, for it to be included in a block. So we were talking about the speed of transactions, you might take that risk, and in fact, when you think about the website uh, Satoshi Dice, they're a gambling website, what they do is they take that risk. They see a transaction and they immediately send you the payment, the winnings if you've won, um, or, or just a small payment in case you've lost, just to show you that you've lost. Um, and somebody might try and defraud them. Somebody might try and replace the history, might, uh, might do that, but they take the risk because the payments are very, very small. And in fact, they haven't seen that happen. Right? It takes a lot of technical uh, skill to, do, to pull off something like that. Yes? One megabyte every 10 minutes. Is that a limit of the system? Because it sounds like if any, you know, any significant number of financial transactions, like every cup of coffee in the world sold, was put through this system, we far exceed one megabyte in 10 minutes. Am I getting the numbers wrong? So the very short answer is come to the talk tomorrow. The longer answer that I will give a, a hint is that in terms of bandwidth, this is not a very hard, this is not a very hard limit. Uh, transaction sizes are about half a kilobyte. So if you wanted to do something like 2,000 transactions per second, uh, you could do it very easily. You, you need one megabyte per second of bandwidth for that. 2,000 transactions per second is what Visa does globally today. Okay, it's uh, something on, around that uh, order of magnitude. So Bitcoin can very easily grow to be Visa's size in terms of bandwidth. But there are other limitations that make the transaction rates uh, act that, that you can actually achieve much lower. And for that, you're going to have to show up tomorrow. Okay, so in terms of bandwidth, there's really no problem. Yeah, so let me kind of try and wrap up. I'm glad to have had all these questions. Um, one more thing that I want to say is that about the 50% attack, if you look at that table before, you can see that if you have 50% of the computational power, there is always 100% chance that you will be able to replace chains because your alternative chain goes, grows faster than that of the network and this could be very bad. And one of the mining pools was recently very close to getting 50% and everybody on Reddit freaked out. Um, but usually this, this doesn't happen. 
Okay, so one more thing. Satoshi Nakamoto could have created a lot of blocks when he set up the system and he might not have told us about it. So to make sure that he didn't do it, the first block that's ever created also encodes a message inside it containing the headline of the paper from that day, from the day that start, he started the system. So you can see Chancellor on Brink of Second Bailout for Banks, that was the headline of the Times at the, at, on, on, on January of uh, 2009. And if you look at uh, the, bl the blockchain in, in ASCII format, you can actually see the message uh, inside there. You, you can do it yourself if you want. You can download the client and check. Um, so I will skip these things on the interest of time. Uh, either that, yes, or he just read the paper. But actually, there, there have been other safe, safeguards put in place that will not allow Satoshi to release blocks, even if he's the editor of the Times and he set, uh, he set the headline of that day. Uh, you cannot replace certain blocks that are very early, and so he has no advantage over everybody else. Uh, so uh, I just want to mention several, I wanted to mention several challenges that Bitcoin is going to face. I'm going to do it more at length at the second talk. Uh, you know, things that are unrelated to computer scientists like regulation and adoption and volatility of the currency, of course, are very, very problematic. Uh, we can also talk about things like the pull of the system towards centralization. There's definitely advantages to being larger in the system. You can gain more money than others. So the system becomes more centralized slowly. Uh, there are issues about scalability, which worried you before, and I will definitely, definitely talk to, about them tomorrow more, because this is part of what I've been doing uh, in my research. And also incentives. The protocol isn't exactly incentive compatible, and we already know of several places where it needs to be improved. Um, and I will skip more details on these. What I will just say to conclude is that we don't know what the future will hold, whether Bitcoin really wins out in the end and survives or whether it crashes, uh, we are definitely seeing a social experiment on a scale that we've never seen before. There's, there's ne there's, there hasn't been an innovation in money uh, on this scale since credit cards in the 50s. Uh, whatever happens, it's definitely going to be more, very interesting. So with that, I'd like to thank you. And again, I'd, I'll give you another small teaser for part two if you want to show up tomorrow. I will tell you how to find both Love and Ben Bernanke hidden in the Bitcoin blockchain. Okay, thank you very much.